This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944 8344. That's 944 8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. VSH.org. We thank you very much for coming. Vegetarian Society of Hawaii is a not for profit volunteer organization. It's the largest local vegetarian society in the country, now with close to 1,800 members. We're delighted to welcome Dr. William Harris to the podium. He's usually seen behind the camera, where you'll see him sitting right now, filming for our Olelo TV shows. Dr. Harris received his medical degree from the University of California at San Francisco after stints in San Diego and Los Angeles, as well as as a voluntary physician in Vietnam, he settled in Honolulu in the emergency department of Kaiser Permanente, where for several years he was also the director of the Vegan Lifestyle Center, which he founded. A vegan for over 40 years, Dr. Harris is a founding member of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, and he has served in a variety of board functions, including newsletter editor, and has been a monthly speaker for us several times. He's currently the coordinator and producer of the weekly TV series, Vegetarian. He's the author of the book, The Scientific Basis of Vegetarianism. Dr. Harris's topic for this evening is Beyond Home Economics 101, Putting Science into Nutrition. Please welcome Dr. William Harris. I retired after 35 years of medical practice in 1998, and I took up skydiving the next day, and I was going to sh try to show you a little bit of that. This is what it looks like at 14,000 feet when you jump out. And I like to do flips because I'm a trampolinist. So you'll see some flips in here. This one's a triple flip with a one-and-a-half twist. This is falling through the sky at 120 miles an hour. That's my parachute. That's Dillingham Field in the background. And I have a ram air parachute. It usually comes down pretty safely, although once in a while I look like Daffy Duck on skates. This is a jump on 91200. It's a four or five and a half somersault out of a Cessna. This is a jump out of a glider. I've been flying gliders for about 55 years. This is the first time I ever jumped out of one. The cameraman went out ahead of me and then caught, kept the glider and me in the frame for about 500 feet. But the better boys don't do flips. They like to jump together. And this is called seat fly. This, this way you fall through the sky at 140 miles an hour instead of 120. And this is a typical landing. I'm also the sponsor coach of the Hawaii High Flyers Trampoline Club, and that's where I get all my real exercise. These are mostly double and twisting triple somersaults. This is a really good exercise. It's equal to long distance running, although I must admit that I cheat a little bit by using the bungee. I wouldn't be able to do this at all if I wasn't, wasn't using the bungee. That's a three and a half twisting front double. Here's some back triples. That's a triple twisting back triple. And the stunt that I just learned about several months ago is coming up. It's a triple twisting back quad. And you can see that the bungee did most of the work on that. But, <laughs> you know, I'll be, I'll be 74 on Tuesday, so I figure I'm lucky to be able to be doing it at all. Thank you. 
I grew up in a family of animal lovers in Minnesota. We had dogs and cats and rabbits and parakeets and God knows what else. And every time one of these animals died, the family would go into mourning for three days. And one day we buried our Cocker Spaniel with full military honors. And then we came home and my mother cooked a roast of lamb. I began to think that there was something a little bit wrong. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought maybe we should stop eating animals. I knew that there were a couple of guys alive in my childhood who'd made it as vegetarians, George Bernard Shaw being one, Mahatma Gandhi being another. He said, live simply that others may simply live. When I got to junior high school, every day the boys would be sent off to shop class to learn how to make table lamps, and the little girls would be sent off to home economics to learn how to bake cakes. Here's a classic example. The measuring system is not very scientific. Cups, ounces, teaspoons, and a pinch of salt doesn't have much value in science to measure things that way. And as you notice, the ingredients are not calculated to produce a very healthy meal, and it didn't. I want to explain this little red arrow because you'll be seeing a lot of this. This is the recommended dietary allowance. If you got all of your calories for the day from this chocolate cake, all of the nutrients to the right of the red arrow would be in adequate supply, namely phosphorus. But everything else would be inadequate. Almost no vitamin C, very little vitamin B6, very little zinc, niacin, potassium, vitamin A, thiamine, iron, folate, magnesium, dietary fiber, vitamin B12, also known as cobalamin, protein, calcium, alpha tocopherol, also known as vitamin E, and riboflavin. The only thing this thing has got is phosphorus. It's 35% of calories from fat, 58% carbs, which is okay. Protein is 7%. If you ate nothing but this chocolate cake, you'd get 610 milligrams of cholesterol, which is twice the upper limit RDA for cholesterol, according to the establishment. The actual upper limit is zero. So that explains it, why these little girls grew up and started feeding their husbands. Their husbands started to look like this. And the reading matter of the little girls started to look like this because this time in history, obesity is the number one nutritional problem in the United States. I'm always amused by nutritionists who come up to argue that vegetarians can't get enough protein or calcium, because in 35 years of medical practice, I never saw a primary deficiency in protein or calcium that had been induced by an inadequate diet. I don't think any of these nutritionists have ever seen such a thing either. What they see day after day is this, which happens to be exactly what I saw day after day as a physician with all of the attendant problems that go with being overweight. I finally went vegetarian when I got to the University of Iowa in 1950, and my coach advised me that I would become calcium and protein deficient. But that was the year I won the Big Ten Trampoline Championship, so I kind of blew that off. But I didn't bother studying nutrition either because I knew that I was going to medical school and when I got to medical school, they would undoubtedly tell me all that I ever would need to know about nutrition. And when I finished up, indeed they had, they'd gotten a whole semester hour of nutrition in medical school. That was the extent of my nutritional education. So when I finished my internship in 1964 at San Diego County Hospital, I decided I wanted to go vegan because somewhere along the line it had sunk in that in order to get milk out of a cow, you've got to keep her pregnant most of the time because mammals only lactate when, after they've been pregnant. Half of the animals that arrive after an induced pregnancy in a cow are male. You don't have any use for them, so you send them off to the slaughterhouse and all of the old cows wind up in the slaughterhouse too. So this is a time when I finally decided to become a vegan, but I didn't know anything about nutrition. So I got out the USDA Agricultural Handbook number eight, which has 
composition of foods per 100 grams edible portion and then here are the various nutrients scattered around the top and the foods are over here on the left maybe to set the stage for what I'm going to do I should mention that I'm going to spend the first half of the lecture criticizing the nutritional establishment for sorting foods by nutrient weight ratio and I'm going to spend the second half of the lecture criticizing the vegetarian movement for some other things that I'll carp about when I get to them. Going through that USDA number eight, I found that Swiss cheese and hamburger were the gold standard in protein per 100 grams edible portion. Pretty good seconds were sunflower seeds and sesame seeds, which came in 24 and 18.6. And if you wanted calcium, it turned out that unhulled sesame seeds are a real bargain. There's 1,100 milligrams of calcium and 100 grams of sesame seeds. So right away I invented this, a fruit smoothie, which you can find the, this online at vsh.org. Strawberries, orange juice, sunflower seeds, unhulled sesame seeds, and flax seeds to get the alpha-linolenic acid, which is the first of the omega-3 fatty acids. And then you put in a little dollop of Red Star T6635 nutritional yeast to get the vitamin B12, which is otherwise missing in a vegan diet. You stick this in a heavy-duty grinder. You could use a cement mixer if you didn't have a Vitamix, but I recommend the Vitamix. It comes out as a very tasty smoothie, and I must admit that although I figured this thing out on the wrong basis, it's still my favorite food, and I use this on a regular basis, although not exclusively. I do eat some other things now. This is a nutrient analysis of the fruit smoothie. Here's the RDA arrow, and almost all of these nutrients are at least equal to the RDA or in excess of them. It's 8% protein, a little short on protein. It's got a lot of fat, a lot more than most vegetarians recommend. Its carbs are okay, 46%. Got tons of vitamin C. All these other nutrients are okay. But that was done by nutrient weight analysis. Now, who else likes nutrient weight analysis? Well, these folks love it because they can claim that whole milk is only 3.5% fat. But if you go back and do the analysis by calories, it turns out that it's 52% of calories from fat. 2% low-fat milk is 35% of calories from fat, and 1% low-fat milk has 23% of calories from fat. Mark Hegstead was a very prominent nutritionist at the Harvard Department of Nutrition, and in 1946 he said this, the recommendation that nutrient labeling be provided in relation to calories has obvious merit. It's now almost 60 years later, and the establishment is still not doing it that way. They're still sorting foods by nutrient weight ratio. Here's a label off promised margarine. It's fat-free, non-fat margarine. The food industry does a little fandango with the Food and Drug Administration. They get to claim that this stuff is zero fat because in a serving, which they have defined to be 14 grams instead of the usual 15 gram tablespoon there's less than a half gram of fat now the fda not only allows but requires that you round off that half gram to the nearest number which is zero in this case they've got 0.49 grams of fat in the serving so they can say that it's got zero fat but there's a little another catch that requires that they display how many calories in a, are in a serving and how many calories are from fat. Turns out there's five calories from fat in a five calorie serving. So that makes this what? 100% fat. Yeah, they get away with this. You know, the number one function of any, every government agency is to look out for the financial interests of the interests that it's supposed to be regulating. I finally got out here to Kaiser Hospital in 1970, and I still didn't know much about nutrition, but I'd gone into the USD nutrient database, and I had charts and graphs all over the wall, what I'd done in longhand to try to figure out what foods I should be eating. And it went on like that with the fruit smoothie being the major part of my diet until I read this book by Keith Akers. This was really an eye-opener. This had the effect on me roughly of 
Saul on the road to Damascus because he was putting out a large table of foods on the basis of the nutrients per hundred calories. This was published in 1983, and after that, I went back into the, the USDA tables and looked at things in an entirely different manner. The first time around, I totally dismissed broccoli and chard as protein sources because they were down around 3.2, 2.5, but when you do it per hundred calories, the broccoli comes out at 11.3 and the chard at 9.6. They're above the hamburger and the Swiss cheese. And furthermore, they're both above the dairy products, 352 milligrams of calcium per 100 calories in the Swiss chard and 321 in the broccoli. If you would like to have the entire USDA database, 6,200 food items in 171 columns, you can download it free from my website, which is here. It gives you the ability to sort not only by nutrient weight ratio, but also by nutrient calorie ratio. And if I can get this thing to come up, give you a little demonstration. Here's the USDA database. This is a thing you can download. Let's sort by, let's say, calcium calories. Okay, this col column is calcium per 100 calories. And baking soda comes in first. That's no big surprise. You don't eat baking soda, but it's full of calcium. I don't know how all the calcium got into the renin tablets, but I don't eat that stuff either. However, from here on down, it's all leafy green vegetables for the next about 44 foods, amaranth leaves, mustard, spinach. Lamb's quarters, by the way, are not lamb's quarters. That's a vegetable. Whey turns out to be the first of the dairy products. So when you sort by calcium calorie ratio, about 40 plant foods come in ahead of the first dairy food. I also have a, a diet questionnaire that you can diet, download at this site. It, will, it has about 900 foods and it all ha also has a diet questionnaire that calculates your body mass automatically. All you have to do is plug in your weight in pounds and your height in inches and out comes your body mass index. But I'm not going to try to illustrate that because I get, got too far off the track. There's some fundamental rules. To maintain health and normal weight Eat foods that will fill your stomach and meet your nutrient requirements before you meet your calorie requirements. That's very important. The Americans that are doing it just the other way around, they're meeting their calorie requirements and they're still short of a lot of nutrients, so they have to keep on eating to get them. But if you fill your stomach, your stomach has stretch receptors that send signals up to the brain that tell you that it's time to quit eating. If you've met your nutrient requirements, there are very complicated feedback mechanisms scattered throughout your brain and your body that will tell you that you're okay on nutrients. And so the calorie committee is going to say, well, we don't have enough calories. And these first two committees are going to say, tough beans, take it out of the fat stores. And that's what happens. You lose weight until you get down to normal weight. Since I'm talking a lot about calories, I want to define what calorie is. It's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree centigrade. A nutritionist calorie is 1,000 of those. One gram of carbohydrate has four calories, a gram of protein has four calories, and a gram of fat has nine calories. And this is not rocket science. We're not sending people to the moon, so don't trust these four, four, nine figures as something that is absolutely correct because they're off by maybe 5%. This is how you figure out how, much, uh, how many calories there are in a food. You put the food in this little container here, put the container in tight inside the calorimeter, pipe in some oxygen, and it measures the amount of heat that comes out. It turns out that when foods are burned in a laboratory calorimeter, they yield the same calories per gram as when metabolized in an animal. So that should legitimize the idea of doing things by calories. I'm going to go back to home economics now, and here's my recipe for a vegetable smoothie. All of these are home economics units, uh, units of measure, but the main ingredient is one cup of raw kale. So what's in a cup of kale? Here's a cup. Is that a cup of kale? There's, 
There's six grams in that. Or is this a cup of kale? There's 85 grams in this. Or you could take the ribs out and smoosh it down and you'd have 100 grams. And this is my standard for a cup of kale. That's what I put in the smoothie. The reason for showing this is to demonstrate that cups are a grossly inadequate means of measuring how much a leafy green vegetable you have. This is what it looks like before you stuff it in the blender. Here's the kale, a little piece of okra that came out of somebody's garden, a piece of onion, some basil, some arugula to give it a little punch, a tomato, broccoli, some Red Star nutritional yeast, a little balsamic vinegar for taste, some garlic to give it some punch, the sunflower seeds, the sesame seeds, the flax seeds, and some spices, and you put it all together. It ends up looking like this, which you might mistake for something out in the middle of a pasture somewhere. I apologize for not being a good French chef. I'm sure that I could dress it up and make it look much more appetizing than this. It was Georgie's idea to put the parsley on top to save it. But this is a really good recipe. Everything is on the right side of the red arrow, including the vitamin B12, and it's on the right side because there's a little red star yeast in there, and all of these other nutrients are out of sight. It is 24% carbohydrate, 14% protein, 62% fat. That's because of the sunflower seeds. No cholesterol, of course, and it has 2.7 grams of ALA, which is alpha linolenic acid. That is the first of the omega-3 fatty acids, one of two essential fatty acids, and the one that's hardest to get in everybody's diet. Compare this with the sour cream chocolate cake. Everything is on the wrong side of the red arrow with that, whereas with the vegetable smoothie, everything's on the right side. So don't eat chocolate cake. How much parsley in a sprig of parsley? Who would ever think of describing anything in terms of sprigs? Turns out that there's 10 grams of parsley in a sprig. And nutritionists tell me, well, you shouldn't even talk about parsley because it's not really a food. It's the garnish. The first thing you do when you order a steak is you take the parsley off the top and you put it on your partner's plate. Nobody eats this stuff, right? It happens to be an extraordinarily good source of iron. The iron content per 100 calories is about twice the iron content of pork liver, which is the highest score in the animal iron department. And actually, average vegetables, 93 of them, are, have about twice as much iron as 27 average meats. The flip side of that is that the iron from animal food is absorbed about twice as easily or rapidly as the iron from vegetables, but the vegetables have twice as much iron. Nobody could possibly eat this much parsley. This is a whole bunch. It's 100 grams. And I must admit that my molars would probably get very tired trying to eat all of this, but you don't have to. What you do is you make a juice out of it. 100 grams of parsley, some carrots, celery, tomato, some Red Star nutritional yeast, and that's what it looks like before you put it into the juicer. And this is what the nutrient analysis comes out to be. All of the nutrients are on the right side of the arrow, and you would see how far to the right of the arrow they are, except the vitamin A comes out here so far that it makes all these others look like they're wimps. But there's plenty of all these nutrients. It's 8% fat, 77% carbs, 15% protein. You only need 10% of calories from protein. Who would ever think that vegetable juice could be a full and complete food? So if you ever get stuck out in a desert island, there's nothing to drink but V8 juice. Don't worry about it. That's almost as good as a V4 juice. Here's another recipe. This is a good party recipe, stuffed bell peppers. One bell pepper, two ounces of rice pilaf, and a sprig of parsley. You steam the pilaf and the peppers and this is what you get. Most of the things are to the right of the arrow, but there are a few things that are over on the wrong side, on the left side. And that's because the rice has dragged down the nutrient values of the stuffed peppers. Very simple recipe here. This is just a mixed green salad with tomatoes and cucumbers. 
But look at the nutrient value of this. It's got everything except vitamin B12, and we could have B12 there if we'd put some Red Star in the dressing. 21% of calories from protein, 7% fat, 72% carbohydrate. When I started out as a vegetarian, people used to eat stuff like this. There's a lot of vegetables and fruit, a lot of leafy greens, and a lot of nuts. Nuts are 75% fat. Avocados are 81% fat by calories. Now, a lot of vegetarians are eating like this. Beans, grains, pasta, and potatoes. And I want to try to figure out where that change took place and who is responsible for it. First of all, we have to note that there are two ways of defining carbohydrate. The scientific method is to write the structural formula over here and then to say carbohydrate is a polymer, a copolymer, or a structural variant of glucose. And some examples are glucose, fructose, sucrose, starch, and cellulose. That's the scientific way of talking about carbohydrate. But here's carbohydrate in the parlance. If you talk to somebody on the street, what's carbohydrate? person will probably say bread, grains, pasta, potatoes, and sugar. Now, who moved in on this mistake? Dr. Atkins did. It was our mistake. We've been recommending those high-carb diets for all these years, but Atkins made a fast buck off of this. He says he shouldn't eat carbohydrates because they're fattening. Now, Atkins put out his first book in 1972, and it was condemned by the American Medical Association, the American Dietetic Association, and just about everybody else that had any scientific credentials. But Atkins did not bother about anything like science. He didn't perform any studies before he published his book. He just went straight to the publisher and made a bundle. His new diet revolution has had the effect of virtually transforming what people eat in this country. If you go into a grocery store, you'll see Atkins-friendly labels on lots of foods. He was not the first low-carb man. In 1863, William Banting wrote a letter on corpulence addressed to the public, and he recommended against the eating of carbohydrates. Barry Sears is another guy. Sears came out with this book in 1995, Enter the Zone. I reviewed this in one of the old issues of the Vegetarian Society newsletter. Here are some of the things he says. Carbohydrates raise insulin levels. Yes, they do. The primary function of insulin is to store fat. Not quite. The primary function of insulin is to get glucose into the cells, but a secondary function is to store fat. Some more quotes from Sears that I sort of like. 8,000 years ago, there were no grains, bread, or pasta. Your genes have not changed for the past 100,000 years. Genetically, mankind has not evolved to eat grains and breads. I think that's all correct. So did we shoot ourselves in the foot? Why do vegetarians glorify carbohydrates and demonize natural plant fat when numerous peer-reviewed references to nuts, seeds, and avocados are mostly positive? I had to put that mostly in because Neil Pinckney, sitting in the front, front row here, just sent me a reference showing that walnuts have some problems with lipids. But there's probably two dozen references saying that Walnuts, although they're high, high in fat, actually help your lipids. One of the first nutritionists that I ran into after I became a vegan was this guy, Herbert Shelton. He founded the American Natural Hygiene Society. Natural hygiene stretches back into the 19th century with names like Sylvester Graham, John Tilden, Russell Trawl, Bernard McFadden. And Shelton himself wrote a rather good book. He advocates an unrestricted vegan diet and therapeutic fasting. That means you, if you're not feeling so well, you stop eating for a day or so, and maybe a couple of days. And if you're really sick, you go to somebody that really knows what they're doing and go on a fast for a longer period of time. He says, no processed foods, but nuts are okay. I think the trouble started with this guy. This is George Ozawa. He was the founder of macrobiotics. Macrobiotics was actually a system that was invented by a Japanese army doctor around 1905, but 
Ozawa brought it over and I saw his first mimeographed edition in 1960 and I blew it off because I thought it was quackery and that it would disappear by itself. But was I ever wrong? Because macrobiotics carried off about half of the vegetarians that I knew. Here are a few macrobiotic quotes. You shouldn't eat fruit because it's too yin. You shouldn't eat yin vegetables. You should limit the intake of liquid to eight ounces of fluid a day. Most health authorities say you should be drinking eight glasses of water a day. He advocates as the highest diet, nothing but brown rice. His disciple Kushi says oil and salt are essential to life, and he says that whole cereal grains are perfectly suited for human consumption. Let's take a look at that last claim. Here's what you'd get if you went on the stage seven macrobiotic diet. Brown rice, nothing but brown rice. If you ate 100% of your calories from brown rice, you'd be deficient in protein, potassium, folic acid, iron, alpha tocopherol, riboflavin, calcium, B12, vitamin C, and A, which probably explains why several people died of malnutrition who had reached the stage seven macrobiotics diet back in the 60s. It doesn't have enough fat and it doesn't have enough sodium either, believe it or not, there's only 42 milligrams of sodium in that amount of brown rice. And that may explain why they say that salt and oil are essential to human health. You wouldn't be much better off eating nothing but grains, 18 average grains, put them into nutritionist four and 100 gram increments, and then average them out so that they contained 2,200 calories, and it turned out that they were deficient to, for all these things over here. They have enough of the things over here, but they're short on everything to the left. They're cheap, and that's a major reason that people think that grains are the cat's meow. Doesn't cost much to buy them. There's another one of Ozawa's offerings. I touch on it peripherally here. If the white of your eyes shows between your lower lid and your iris, there's something wrong with you. Did anybody ever see this book? It was at Down to Earth maybe 15 years ago. I have a little experiment you can perform on yourself when you get home. Look in the mirror, look at your eyes in the mirror, and then turn your head down like this, as I am now doing, and you will become instantly sanpaku, because that's how eyes work. It doesn't have anything to do with disease or anything being wrong with you. That's quackery. Here's some more macrobiotic references. You can find a bit of it at www.quackwatch. And you can also get the macrobiotic side of it at the Cushy Institute. Macrobiotics has left a trail of pediatric debris in its wake. Anemia, hypocalcemia, kwashiorkor, osteoporosis, rickets, tetany, vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin K deficiency, zinc deficiency. It's seen in macrobiotics, rastafarians, black Hebrews, and, quote, vegan-like diets. And this is where the problem for us is. The nutritionists, the people that write in peer-reviewed journals keep confusing macrobiotics with vegetarianism and veganism. They're not the same. In the early stages of macrobiotics, you eat fish, which is not vegetarian. Where'd we get this idea that grains were the cat's meow, the best possible food? It started about 12,000 years ago in the Mediterranean basin with the agricultural revolution. People started domesticating animals and growing wheat and barley in these various areas in Mesopotamia. The main result of that agricultural revolution was not that people got healthier, or that they necessarily had any more free time on their hands. What happened was that the human population increased 16-fold. It went from about 5 million people in 10,000 BC to 86 million in 6,000 BC. The people were probably less healthy than their pre-agricultural ancestors. What happens when you feed a wild animal? Supposing you go out and you try to be kind to the deer in the winter, they're freezing. So you go out and feed them. And what happens? The next year you got more deer. Well, people are the same way. You do not improve the health of any animal species by giving it free lunch. You try to improve the things that are in that lunch rather than increasing the amount. 
This is the main reason that grains are so important in our agriculture and in the agriculture revolution. They keep, you can store them for 240 days in one of these silos. If you tried to do that with fruits and vegetables, they'd be gone in the morning, they'd spoil. Here's a few other food categories that vegetarians are fond of, potatoes. They're deficient in folate, zinc, riboflavin, calcium, etc. They've got all of these things. You can live on potatoes for a long time, but it's not optimal food. They're cheap. Bread, not surprisingly, has about the same nutritional deficiencies as grain, calcium, potassium, zinc, etc. And look up here at this huge amount of sodium. These are commercial breads. The food industry makes stuff with the thought of creating addictions. It wants you to become addicted to its bread, so it puts in a huge amount of salt. The things that really make for addictive food are salt, fat, and sugar. And the food industry uses all of those things ad libitum. The beans, that's another vegetarian favorite. And it's pretty good food, but it's missing a few things. And it's fairly cheap. And it has a lot of protein, 26%. So beans are fairly good food. Fruits are very important in a well-balanced diet, but not because of this chart, because it shows that they're deficient in B12, zinc, protein, calcium, phosphorus, and barely makes it for iron. The dairy foods for the people who are lacto-vegetarians are also deficient in all the nutrients to the left of the red arrow. They have lots of protein, 25%. Cost is not too bad. Costs, incidentally, have to be taken with a grain of salt. These are average costs according to Nutritionist 4, but they don't reflect real market costs. Just, I think the relative costs are in the right order. Okay, now here's the one category that's almost complete. The only thing missing from these 97 average vegetables is vitamin B12. Everything else is to the right of the arrow. They're super expensive because they don't keep. You have to buy them refrigerated or frozen or something, some way to get around the spoilage problem. So those are the problems with bread, grains, and starches. They're deficient in five nutrients, and they also have high glycemic indices, which means that they'll raise your blood sugar level rather rapidly. As far as problems with raw nuts and seeds and avocados, all the peer-reviewed literature is positive, except for the one that I already mentioned. This is a bit on the glycemic index. How many people have heard of glycemic index? It is the rate at which a food will raise your blood sugar relative to pure glucose. And there's a table that was put out by the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It contains 1,691 rows of foods, but only 171 rows contain unprocessed plant foods. Most of the others are proprietary breakfast cereals, cookies, cakes, and recipes, many containing dairy and meat. So here's a glycemic index table. Let's see if I can read this if I turn around. Put on your reading glasses, folks, or your telescope. I, I'll have to tell you that the ones with the highest glycemic index are over here on the right side of the chart, and they are the things that we usually refer to as carbohydrates in the parlance. Jasmine rice, glutinous rice, baked potato, white bread, millet, barley, rice, sweet potato, and then you get down here to the other end, and you have things like peanuts, soybeans, cherries, grapefruit, let's see, apples, pears. Things that you would expect would have high glycemic indices because they're sweet. But they also have a lot of fiber, and the fiber keeps the sugar from getting absorbed too rapidly. And so these low glycemic index foods are really better for you. Well, now, I'm trying to trace where we got the idea that high-carb, low-fat should be the gold standard of nutrition. The first reasonable guy that I came on to was Nathan Pritikin. How many people have heard that name? Okay, Pritikin was not a, an MD, and he was not a nutritionist. He was an engineer, and he was a smart one. And back in the mid-60s, when he developed coronary heart disease and his doctors told him he was going to die, Nathan said, no thanks. And he went out and studied the literature and he found graphs that looked like this. These are graphs done by Ansel Keys and Ken Carroll that show that the more animal fat in the diet, the higher the rate of heart disease. 
This graph I did myself. I calculated the correlation coefficient, which is pretty high. This is a regression line, and as you can see, the countries that eat the most fat have the highest index of coronary heart disease. Conversely, I plotted heart disease against plant calories, and the regression line goes down. John McDougall was the next guy up to bat with the high carbohydrate plan. He recommends that you base your diet on starch and grains. And he says that nuts are too high in fat for regular use. Now John has spoken to us many times and there are many people here who owe him a great debt, including me. John rotated through the Kaiser Emergency Room as an internal medicine resident in 1974. I was a staff physician and I was delighted to find some other guy who was for all intents and purposes a vegetarian, although John would rather be boiled in snake oil than admit it. He thinks that the word vegetarian has bad connotations, but his books were the first to be referenced by scientific literature. It was a first step in actually putting vegetarianism on a scientific basis. So it was a good book, and all the rest of his books were good, and he's done a lot of good for a lot of people, but I don't agree that your diet should be based on starches and grains and that you shouldn't eat nuts. Michael Clapper, a fellow that I just saw a couple of days ago over on Maui, I was going to razz Michael for being another high-carb, low-fat man, but he says that nuts and seeds are okay on page 51, and he's got avocados and almonds and sunflower seeds on the cover. So I think his advice is pretty good, and that's a good book. Mark Sorensen, we've had him speak to us. He does nutrient indexing, which is great. He sorts food by nutrient calorie ratio, but he says high starch, low fat. And Dean Ornish, who is probably the ultimate in high carb, low fat, succeeded in regressing coronary heart disease in patients and demonstrating proving it with coronary angiograms that showed that the diameter of the coronary artery increased about 3%. But his diet is vegetables, grains, and dried beans. No, no mention of nuts or seeds. I think these guys would have gotten the same results with their patients if they had said, well, it's okay to eat nuts and seeds as long as they're raw, as long as they're not salted, they're not processed, and you might even throw in an occasional avocado. The reason I think it's such a mistake to demonize fat is that there would be no life on this planet without fat. Fat is not soluble in water, right? If you put fat on top of water, it just sits there. It doesn't mix with the water. This is why. These are two fatty acid chains they're connected to a glycerol molecule, and on one end of the glycerol is a phosphoryl group. The phosphoryl is a polar compound. It's soluble in water because water is also polar. So if you get a layer of those phospholipids together on the surface of the water, the phosphorols take up with the water molecules, and the fatty acids do not, but they'll take up with another phospholipid layer and form this phospholipid bilayer. And this is an absolutely fundamental phenomenon in nature. This is a schematic of a cell, a phospholipid bilayer, forming a sphere. You only see one half of the sphere, but it's there. There's water on the outside here. There's water on the inside. The water on the inside has enzymes and other biochemicals that are conducting civilized transactions with each other. And they're protected from the outside by this phospholipid bilayer. This is a typical animal cell membrane. The little blue doodads here are the phosphorols. The yellow chains are fatty acids. And these little brown molecules here are cholesterol, which is used as a stabilizing agent for the membrane. The white strands here are proteins and glycoproteins. This is a typical animal cell. The membrane is made of phospholipids, that's fat, reinforced by cholesterol. This is a typical plant cell. Its membrane is also made out of phospholipids, but it doesn't have any cholesterol because it doesn't need to be reinforced because on the outside there is a tough, fibrous cell wall, which is made out of cellulose, 
which is a kind of fiber. So that's why when you eat animal food, you get a load of cholesterol, and when you eat plant food, you get almost none. The other reason I don't think it's such a great idea to demonize fat is that it's hard, hard to get enough alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, if you don't eat some nuts and seeds. Now, I'm not recommending salted or roasted seeds. I'm talking about raw nuts and seeds. You can see that if you need 2.4 grams of alpha-linolenic acid a day, which is approximately what you need, but the only way you're going to get it is by eating some nuts and seeds because all of these other categories here are on the left side of the RDA arrow. Finally, I want to make a pitch for raw vegan diet, and I want to explain it this way. This rather complicated and busy graph shows the nutrient values of some foods that are usually cooked and compares them with some foods that you can eat raw. The foods that you can eat raw, like spinach, the V4 juice, romaine lettuce, alfalfa sprouts, and 96 vegetables, as you can see, have very much more protein, calcium, iron, riboflavin, vitamin A, and zinc than these so-called carbohydrate foods up here, potatoes, brown rice, winter wheat, and pasta, and 18 breads, which barely make it to the RDA line. So the take-home messages are, Sort foods by nutrient calorie ratio, not nutrient weight ratio, because there's no RDA for weight. You don't have to eat X pounds of food to be healthy. You do have to make the RDAs for all of your essential nutrients. That puts leafy greens, fresh fruit, nuts, and seeds at the top of the list, not grains and starches. It also indicates that a raw vegan diet is probably the healthiest. And I'm going to get myself off the hook with this by saying that if you're happy with your present vegetarian diet, stick with it. If you feel healthy, if, if you're on a high-carb, low-fat diet, and you like it, and everything is going well, by all means, stick with it. Because, as I said earlier, nutrition is not rocket science, and I'm not a rocket scientist. I could be wrong, but... I, this is my best shot at giving nutritional information. And lastly, don't be afraid of natural plant fat. That doesn't mean refined oils. It doesn't mean hydrogenated oils. And it certainly doesn't mean animal fat. And if you do all those things, you'll also be in tune with the Hawaii Five-A-Day program, which recommends that you eat five or more servings of fruits and vegetables a day for better health. I think you ought to eat 15 or more. So that is my presentation, and I'll take some questions. Coconut oil. There's a lot of people who think that coconut oil is bad for you because it's a saturated fat. And I have seen some literature citations that back that up, showing some cholesterol elevation from using uh, coconut oil. But I take this with a very big grain of salt. Unless you're really scarfing down the coconut oil, I don't think it's going to do you any damage. I don't think palm oil will either, although that's also allegedly saturated. How did our school lunch get loaded with pasta? Yeah. It's a matter of relativity. The school lunch is loaded with meat and junk food, and so pasta is a step upward from that. Uh, it's cheap. That's certainly one consideration. The school lunch does use pasta because it's filling and there are a whole bunch of things in the school lunch that are much worse than pasta. So I wouldn't condemn the school lunch for the pasta. I'm going to have to research that because I'm not sure what's been going on in the school food service before about eight years ago when I started getting involved in it. I do know that the guy that's running it, Gene Kanashiro, is doing his best to provide healthier meals for Hawaii's kids. But whatever you do, you have to deal with the USDA because the USDA is calling the shots in the school food service all over the country. And they want to push products that are basically fattening. They, a lot of meat, a lot of cheese, things that are really not too good for you. Carl? I didn't, uh, okay, Carl says, I didn't say anything bad about cooked vegetables. No, I don't think there's anything wrong with cooked, cooked vegetables. I suspect they're better for you if you eat them raw. I suspect that 
The foods that you have to cook, I'm pretty sure, all have lower nutrient values than the foods that can be eaten raw. That's, that was the whole purpose of that last slide, raw versus cooked. But I have no objection to cooking stuff. The question is, is it better to eat three big meals a day or to become a grazing animal and just chew through the day? I think the latter. I think the best thing you can do, first of all, boycott the food industry because they're not your friend. Go, go to work with healthy food, take it with you, and just chomp on it through the day. Make sure that it is really healthy and that it has all the nutrients you, that you need, and you will have an easier time losing weight that way, and you won't overstuff yourself either. Nutritional supplements. Should they be in whole food? I don't think whole food in the true sense needs to be supplemented. I, whole food is things like spinach and pears and avocados and apples and things like that. And they don't need any supplements. They pretty much have everything. If you want to take a vitamin pill every day, that's pretty good nutritional insurance. It will keep you out of the situation where you come in with a nebuloma, which is a disease that nobody can figure out, a deficiency disease. Not many doctors are equipped to diagnose deficiency diseases. So if you take a vitamin pill every day, a multivitamin, you will eliminate the possibility of having to deal with that. But as far as really needing the supplement, I don't really think it's necessary. How heavily contaminated are raw nuts and seeds by pesticides? I don't know. I don't think they're labeled organic. I think even when things are labeled organic, it's kind of a toss-up. You're never sure what you're getting. I do think that you should get organic whenever you can. It's probably particularly important in the case of fatty things like seeds because pesticides, being organic chemicals, tend to concentrate in the fatty tissues of both plants and animals. Why don't kids crave vegetables? <laughs> and I wish I knew the answer to that. Georgie's here with her grandnephew who refuses to eat anything green. Yeah? And I don't know why kids hate things that are green. If I want to produce something that a kid will eat, I'll try to make it look brown and dead, and then I'll eat it. A lemonade diet? Master cleanser. What's in it besides lemonade? Lemonade, cayenne pepper, it's not going to do you any harm, but my feeling with all bizarre diets is that before you go on one, you need to get a well-balanced vegan diet because that's the optimal diet that you're going to have to return to. There's no point going on a crash diet if you haven't learned how to be a healthy vegan. And once you've gotten adapted to a healthy vegan, you probably won't have to go on a diet again. You're going to be okay. But I wouldn't have any objection to the lemonade diet or the Jarvis maple syrup and cider advice. I don't think it's going to do you any harm. There are some diets out there that will do you harm. Atkins is probably one of them. But that, the damage that Atkins does is not going to show up for 20 or 30 years. Okay, the question is fried foods in the school. Fried food is one of civilization's disasters. You, there's no way, nothing you can do to food worse than frying it because you coat it with a thick layer of fat that has been heated up and has produced a lot of peroxides and strange chemicals that you don't want in your diet. Particularly it's bad to fry with hydrogenated oil because the hydrogenated oil acts just like a saturated fat and raises cholesterol. It also gets into cell membranes and nobody knows what the consequences of that is. However, your, your cell membranes only have cis fatty acids normally and getting trans fats into the cell membranes probably damages your immunity. I don't know what to do about the fried foods, except that everybody complain and try to get them out of the, certainly out of the public schools. Bad news. Well, thank you all for your attention. I'll stick around, and if anybody has questions, you can ask, feel free to ask me. And Alita is going to... Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris. Again, we have refreshments out in the uh, lanai in the back. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next month.
This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.